Pierre-Olivier Antoine, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your office in the University of Montpellier, France. You are a professor of paleontology at the University of Montpellier with a special interest in rhinoceroses and their extinct relatives. Welcome to the show, Pierre. Your research takes you all over the world and you've led many, many expeditions to such far-flung places as the Amazon and the Andes. Uh, you're back in France at the moment, but no doubt you'll be... Um, flying off on another adventure soon yeah sure um hello mark yeah the next one will be in may and we will be again in the uh, bolivian altiplano at four thousand meters above sea level but in the meantime most likely i will also uh, be much closer from here and uh, trying to excavate rhinos uh, from the montpellier area in a secret place. Before we take our audience on a journey into the world of the woolly rhino and its evolutionary relatives, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Pierre, did you always have an interest in prehistoric megafauna and, in particular, ancient rhinos? So uh, I was always uh, always interested in, in vertebrate paleontology, but my first love was for um, proboscideans. The proboscideans, these are the, the order that um, includes today the elephants, which includes also as fossil representatives mammoths and mastodons. More specifically, I was working on dinotheres, the elephant-like uh, animals that had tusks um, curved into the lower jaw. And that was my, my work as a first master's student, first year master's student. And then uh, for my real uh, master's thesis, I got involved into uh, rhinos. And uh, because my uh, supervisor, Professor Pascal Tassi, and Francis Duranton from Toulouse, they checked that there would not be many, many rhino specialists 10 years later. Uh, that means when I would be trying to find a job. So they think about rhinos, and then I follow up. And uh, finally, the first 10 years of my career were focused on uh, rhinos, uh, rhino biogeography and rhino evolution. And then I was hired as um, an assistant professor in Toulouse University, not far away from here. But the condition was to shift to Amazonia and Andes. So I knew absolutely nothing about this region. And obviously, there are no rhinos in that area. So I had to begin, start again from scratch. And I didn't know anything about the paleontology of South America. Well, uh, finally, it turned uh, to be pretty good. I got the position and I had to move to South America and no regret because I still work on rhinos and now I have a pretty good knowledge on the Amazon basin. Well, the woolly rhino is an animal we know from ancient cave paintings as well as modern paleo artworks. It's a member of the genus Cilodonta and lived during the Pleistocene, a very cold time period in our past, often referred to as the Ice Age. Pierre, what is the story of the woolly rhino? Well, the woolly rhino was first interpreted and recognized through the very last skeletons and remains from the late Pleistocene. I that means uh, the last dozens of thousand years ago, because there was a, a bunch of them all over northern Eurasia, in Asia, Siberia, and in Europe. So there were many of them 
due to their size, it was easy to find them. They were recognized as a fossil species in the 18th century, because the, the species was recognized in 1799. So it's a very, very uh, small club of uh, pre-19th century uh, extinct species. And um, this woolly rhino, uh, called Silonanta antiquitatis, the rhino will, with separated teeth that is antique, that is uh, old. Uh, this species is not the, the only one. It was, um, it's called woolly rhino because uh, carcasses um, were found in the permafrost from Siberia and other ones found also in salt mines in, um, in Poland and they have or they had uh, fur. So it was uh, probably a response to the, to the climate, the ice age climate. But these uh, woolly rhinos, they are not the only ones uh, within the genus Celodonta. The other ones, they are older and they are Celodonta tologoigensis from uh, Siberia also. That is older from the uh, early and middle Pleistocene and before was living in China uh, the species Celodonta nihoanensis and even before from Tibet, from the Tibetan plateau uh, was recently recognized 12 years ago the oldest representative of that genus namely Silodon tibetana. All of them are known only by uh, cranial, mandibular and bo um, remains and bones, as well as teeth. So no uh, flesh remain, no fur, no horns. And the most we know about the woolly rhino genus, Silodon, comes from the real woolly rhino, the um, Celodonta antiquitatis. So this animal basically was about um, 12 feet long, that means something like uh, three meters and a half, and that was, it was also from uh, six, five to seven feet high at the shoulder, which is uh, one meter and a half up to two meters high. More or less the, the same stature as a white rhino today. And they were probably weighing something, weighing something like two to three tons. Uh, that is also the, the, the size and, and um, the weight of a white rhino today. So very, very big uh, animals. So uh, as for that diet, those uh, giant animals were uh, purely herbivores and they were grass eaters, what we call grazers. So they were like um, a mowing machine with um, very high teeth and I got some teeth here. So they had high teeth with high crown able to um, accommodate abrasive diet made of grass and probably also of um, dust from the soil. The most striking feature of the woolly rhino are its horns. The species had two horns on its head, the front horn reaching almost a meter in length. Pierre, what can you tell us about these horns and what may have been their evolutionary purpose? Well, those rhinos, they, are, they have two horns and they, they belong to a group um, including the white and the, and the black rhinos today that still have two horns. The nasal horn, that is the longest one, and the frontal horn on the front, that is smaller and behind. So the, the nasal horn in the um, woolly rhino, at least in uh, Celodonta antiquitatis, because they are known, they have been preserved in several cases uh, from the permafrost of Siberia, The 
this nasal horn is always super narrow. It's narrow from the left to the right side and um, it, uh, as it's made out of keratin, uh, it's not easy to, to get preserved. And um, most, if, if not all, horns were super narrow. So everybody uh, was thinking about this horn to be narrow. And that was um, at odds with the insertion on the nasal, on the nasal bones of the woolly rhino that are wide from left to right. So th there was like a discrepancy into, between the support and the, the horn itself. And Russian colleagues are being demonstrated right now thanks to um, a very well preserved nasal horn that in fact it was as wide as the nasal bones but the external fibers keratinous fibers on the left side and on the right side they were probably uh, much more difficult uh, to be preserved and they were decaying easily so uh, it would explain why uh, most horns that are preserved lack the external and external layers and only have the core that is super narrow so it's a long demonstration to show that there is no more discrepancy between the horn support, the horn boss, and the horn itself. Another thing that is super interesting about the, the woolly rhino horn is that they have um, a flattened surface for the frontal side of the horn. So this flattened surface is interpreted as having allowed the, the woolly rhinos to shovel the snowy ground in order to get their grass, grass or lichens they, they were feeding on. So that's um, a hypothesis, but it's super consistent with what we know about their uh, diet from the stomach content of some of them and also from the uh, abrasion marks left by dust and by grass on their teeth so this is a consistent story and is it true pierre that uh, they use their horns for for fighting during like battles between males and that kind of thing yeah and the horns they had uh, probably another use that is more uh, sexually related and that were probably um uh, a weapon to fight between males, probably, and there are um, injuries on uh, some elements, some skeletons, some rib cages, some um, long bones, and that that might be at some point consequences of uh, shocks and contacts, heavy contacts between the horns, the head, and the um, and the rib cages. And what about the relationship between these animals and human populations of the time? We know from archaeological findings and ancient cave art that humans and megafauna definitely interacted. So why did humans hunt this animal? And were human beings ultimately responsible for its extinction? Well, it's a good question or a good sequence of questions. Uh, well, we know that the, those animals did interact with humans because the, there are hundreds of rhinos uh, painted or engraved in caves, especially in France and in southwestern or southeastern France. Uh, so they interacted and most likely they were like respecting the rhinos as prey to feed on but also as very good um, uh, stragglers, um, opponents uh, to be hunted. So we know that they were using the 
flesh for eating and they were probably also using everything like tendons like bones uh, for their tools there are, there are in china tools made out of um, rhino bones and even of rhino teeth also neanderthals uh, they they have the neanderthal men they have used uh, jaws and skulls of mammoth and woolly rhinos to build up the bases of their camps in uh, at least in uh, in asia in uh, caucasus and uh, in kazakhstan so it's obvious that those two or three tones animals were an excellent food for them and that uh, they were using anything I, I i think that it was super super hard to to kill one rhino and uh, probably they would eat at, until the last uh, gram of flesh and and use everything and we're talking just about antiquitatis aren't we yeah and uh, this these interactions between uh, woolly rhinos and humans they are only ascertained with uh, between neanderthals hu uh, modern humans and the woolly rhino the silodonta antiquitatis those interactions they're not attested uh, with other species. So uh, only with woolly rhino. And I forgot to say that most likely they were using also their fur because in those ice ages, uh, having such a fur or, uh, could be a, a very, very good advantage um, against, the, um, against cold temperatures as for for wearing or for covering a camp or something like that so most likely they were using that i have no proof uh, direct proof for that so the the, the woolly rhinos they uh, were extirpated something like 10000 years ago which is a very very small uh, time gap from now this is very uh, close to us and at that time, well, there might be two, um, two competing theories for explaining why and how they got extirpated. So the first one is the direct influence of human, uh, which more or less coincides with what we call the overkill theory. So too much hunted and uh, the species got uh, extinct. The other, on the other way, the competing theory is like, well, the woolly rhinos were ice-aged animals, and when the ice age collapsed and the temperature, the global temperature just climbed, rose, especially in northern Eurasia, well, it's more, it was not cold enough for the rhinos, so they got, they had to restrict, get restricted to the northernmost uh, latitudes in northern uh, Siberia, for instance, like Mammoth did, and the very last populations well got extinct uh, 10,000 years ago. Then uh, this seems to be corroborated by the fossil record but the very last fossil record of uh, woolly rhinos is about 13,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago and more recently colleagues have uh, tried to find clues of the presence of woolly rhinos after their uh, apparent extinction it might not be clear uh, as a sentence, but I, uh, I would try to be clear. So they used a new um, method that is called sedimentary DNA or environmental DNA. So they just sampled sediment 
that was 10,000 years old. And that sediment may, especially in frozen uh, grounds, preserve some DNA of the animals that were roaming the steppes. So they checked and they, they did find that there was woolly rhino DNA in the sediment. More uh, clearly, it was in dungs. So um, this, is, this is super interesting because it shows once again that the fossil record is by essence incomplete and that the very last fossils you have are not the remains of the very last individuals that were in fact living. The very last individuals have very low probability to get preserved in the fossil record. But now we can get access eventually to their DNA. So that it's, it's a super, super step forward. You also study the distant ancestors of rhinos going as far back as millions of years before the woolly rhinoceros. Pierre, what can you tell us about these ancient rhino relatives? Well, today there are something like five distinct species of rhinos. Unfortunately, within a couple of decades, there might be only three uh, species remaining because two of them are highly endangered and the Sumatran rhino and the Javan rhino, I'm not, not very sure that they will make it for more than two decades. But in the past, there were hundreds, really hundreds of species of rhinos. The family of rhinos, Rhinocerotidae, they count something like 220 species. This family appears uh, something like 40 uh, million years ago and there was, there always was um, a huge diversity of rhinos first in Eurasia and North America, yeah, in North America and then in Europe at the same time as Asia and North America, and then in Africa, and even into Panama. So the, the diversity of fossil rhinos is completely underestimated because we are, um, we always are influenced by what we know today. And today there are only five rhino species. Outside of the rhino family, there are other rhinos called invicotheres or giant rhinos or uh, giraffe rhinos that were hornless but so huge that they are claimed to be among the largest land mammals that ever existed on Earth. Those invicotheres they were found first in Balochistan in the western part of Pakistan. They were described in the, in the early uh, 20th century and it was impossible to go there for reasons of conflicts between the tribes there. And I have been lucky enough to be part of the only team able to go there in the late uh, 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century and we could find once again the original quarry where the first giant rhino was found. This is the Baluchitherium quarry in Derabukti. So we could find thousands of bones or hundreds of bones and we could um, reconstruct a complete skeleton composite skeleton, but from the original site. And then also, I was uh, lucky enough to participate in an expedition, and then many expeditions to Turkey, and to find, for the first time, giant rhinos in Turkey. 
So finally, we could find elements um, from a, a bunch of individuals, especially very, very huge um, individuals. A jaw and a partial skeleton and many um, limb bones and that that's so cool to have uh, to to be able to to find this this uh, specimens but it was not my my uh, main topic my main topic is on the family of the rhinos and I first um, started as a PhD student working on another huge rhino, extinct, but recently extinct, nicknamed the uh, Siberian unicorn, and uh, which genus is Elismotherium. This animal was living at the same time as the woolly rhino, and living at the same time as the woolly mammoth, and with no surprise, it was probably woolly itself. The um, Siberian unicorn was as tall as a mammoth. And this animal is super similar with the, um, to the, the woolly and white rhino in the fact that they had uh, high crowned teeth able to make them graze uh, over the, their lifetime. Many colleagues were thinking about Elethmotherium as being closely related to the woolly rhino. And as a PhD student, I said, I, I found that probably they had split very early in the rhino history. So it was not admitted by everybody. And it was in 2002. And it could have been the end of the story. But two years later, DNA colleagues, DNA wizards, could reconstruct the complete genome of three extinct genera of rhinos, including Celodonta antiquitatis, the woolly rhino, Stephanorinus, the steppe rhino, and the Siberian unicorn, Elasmotherium sibiricum, and, surprise, surprise, Elasmotherium sibiricum had diverged very early in the history of rhinos, so I was not that wrong. So this is super, super interesting. But at the same time, I was wrong also because I had claimed that the woolly and the white rhinos were related based on anatomical um, clues. That means the, the teeth, skulls, and mandibles, what we can see on, on fossil specimens and what can also be observed on recent animals was um, like tricky. It was supposed to show that woolly rhino and white rhinos were closely related. And the genomes now clearly show that I was wrong and that the woolly and the white rhinos, they are convergent. That means they independently acquired the same head posture, the same crown height, and the same um, precise features because they had the same food and they shared that without sharing the same history. But it must have been very uh, gratifying for you, Pierre, that uh, the DNA confirmed that paper you wrote 20 years previously. Yeah, and uh, ha having a, a confirmation by independent uh, by independent colleagues and something like that is completely, fully irrefutable. Well, it, it's a super victory 20 years later. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still super pleased to have uh, been uh, invited to, uh, to participate in that molecular adventure, DNA adventure, because I don't understand many things, 
but I think uh, I, I could help in some way and uh, I learned many, many things. You always learn when you're a uh, scientist from other ones. Well, you've co-authored a book, Le Mystère des Géants, The Mystery of the Giants in 2018. So what new projects are on the horizon for you? And can you reveal any new information that's come to light regarding ancient rhinos? Yeah, uh, right now uh, we are just on, on a project with a colleague, Lionel Autier, and we are um, being committed to, to uh, write a book about the prehistorical mammals. Uh, so it might be uh, published next year if everything goes right. And you can be sure that the woolly rhinos and all the rhinos, including giant rhinos, will be will be in. At the same time, I'm committed in a in a project in French Guiana in the tropics. And if we get the if we get funded for the project, we will try to mix the um, field um, field work for fossils and field work for sedimentary DNA in order to get um, cross information about the, the ancient ecosystems, especially if we can get evidences of the presence, the early presence of humans. So for the interaction between humans and megafauna and megafauna. Among the last results of interest um, is a, a discovery from uh, hyena dungs. This is quite surprising, but the, um, the environmental DNA, you can use for that dungs and dungs of predators or scavengers. And depending on what they did eat, you can even get DNA from the prey. And that turned out recently to be of interest for woolly rhinos and some Hyena dungs from Germany were uh, sequenced or were uh, investigated, and DNA sequences were from both hyena and from woolly rhinos. And what is interesting is that they could uh, get some sequences that sh likely show that the European populations, at least the ones that were um, investigated through Jena Dunks in Germany are uh, probably um, diverging, early diverging from all the, the sequences that were known um, before and that come from Siberia. So that would plead for um, early dispersal of real woolly rhinos from Siberia to Europe and they would have maintained in Europe for a long time. This is also in good agreement with results recently found um, on the phylogeny, that means based on um, phylogenetic relationships of all the rhinos belonging to Silodonta that was published by Antigo Nuzunidis and colleagues and showing that uh, there was no Silodonta tologoigensis of Siberian affinities in the late middle Pleistocene of Europe but early representatives of the real woolly rhino. So everything seems to be consistent now. There were early woolly rhinos in Europe belonging, already belonging to the species Celodonta antiquitatis. So that, that's cool, once again. It certainly is a fascinating field of study. I just want to thank you for taking the time to come on to the show today. I will leave links to your book and research papers in the description below, and hopefully we can have you back on the show one day in the very near future. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for having me on. And uh, I will be 
really pleased to to interact with you in another interview on Giant Sloth on whatever uh, can be interesting for you. <laughs>